Greetings, my name is Louise Dente, and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition, we're joined by Dr. William Sorrell, Professor Emeritus of African and African American Studies, who will be um, joined by our special guest, um, Dr. James McIntosh. He is a practicing psychiatrist uh, in, the, in New York, as well as the co-chair of CIMOTAP, the Committee to Eliminate the Media Offensive to African People. Um, they will discuss some current events as relates to politics in the U.S. Uh, welcome to uh, another episode of Cultural Caravans. I'm Dr. William Sorrell, and my guest today is Dr. James McIntosh, a psychiatrist who's uh, active in our community. Uh, Donald Trump has been in office for 10 months, seems like 10 years, and there's a lot of questions about his mental stability. Uh, we know that he lies. <clears throat> Fact checks have shown that he lies at least five to six times every day, so you can multiply that by all the days he's been in office. And what we understand about Donald Trump, and I as a historian believe he's gonna go down as the worst president ever in American politics. He's gonna replace James Buchanan. Now, the issue that we have with Donald Trump is his mental stability. We had, have had bad presidents on policies, but Donald Trump is a bad president, not only on policies, but on the problems that we face in a nuclear age. Uh, there are historians and there are psychiatrists who believe that he's unfit to be president, he doesn't have the temperament, he's, he has delusions about his own grandeur, he thinks he's the smartest person in the world. And recently several senators, Senator Bob Coker, Senator uh, Murphy, have questioned his temperament and basically said he's unfit to be in office. Now I think he's off his rocker, I think he's lost his marbles. <laughs> I think he's not uh, wrapped too tightly, and I can say that because I'm an ordinary citizen. Recently, the question has come up about psychiatrists. Now, we know there's a code of ethics where psychiatrists are not supposed to make a decision about someone's mental stability without having them as a patient. And so, like Dr. McIntosh, first to tell us why is that the case, and then second to tell us why are so many psychiatrists violating the code of ethics by speaking about Donald Trump's uh, lack of competence to be president of the United States? Well, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, the second one is uh, why are so many, uh, in your opinion, violating? I don't think they're violating. I think that what they have is conflicting uh, ethical standards. So that uh, the, the first part, which you asked, was about um, what was that you know, reason that they can't talk about a, a person if they haven't examined them. There's something called the Goldwater Rule. It's a part of the American Psychiatric Association's um, uh, guidelines in which they, you know, say that you shouldn't do that. And the history of it is that when Barry Goldwater was running for president, I guess that would be in about 1964, yes. uh, he was, you know, a real unusual character. And some people took a, a petition, you know, and, and uh, a lot of mental health practitioners were involved in that, and they, um, they eventually, the a APA itself was sued, the American Psychiatric Association itself, I believe, was sued, uh, and uh, may have, you know, they, they may have even been, uh, they may have even lost the suit, but for whatever reason, they were kind of uh, shy about psychiatrists doing that again. And so they put that into their, uh, as I said before, their guidelines. Yeah, see, at that time there was a famous ad showing a little girl with a daisy, and then you had this huge mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. Right, 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 exactly. And so, but now there's another um, injunction that psychiatrists are under, which is that when you know of a specific threat to an individual, it's called the Tarasoff rule, and what that, there was a guy who was uh, infatuated with a young lady uh, by the name of Tarasoff, and um, he uh, was rejected by her, and he revealed to his psychiatrist that he wanted to kill her. So uh, eventually, he did kill her, and you know, uh, 
it was felt that he, the psychiatrist was liable, that he had a duty to warn, a duty to protect, and that would be protection in the form of warning uh, this young woman, Tarasov. And so that's called the Tarasov rule. The, you know, one of the few times when a psychiatrist should violate confidentiality is when you know there's a specific threat. So what some psychiatrists have said is that, well, yeah, uh, you know, maybe the Goldwater rule is one thing that we shouldn't talk about somebody we haven't examined. But on the other hand, if we re believe there's a specific threat to not just an individual, but to maybe an entire country or in some people, you know, if you really want to be grandiose about the, the whole world, uh, that we should say something. So even before the election, you had uh, a couple of uh, Harvard psychiatrists, one of them being Judith Herman, uh, and two others uh, that wrote, I think the other one was Mossbacker, and they wrote to um, Barack Obama when Trump was just the president-elect, and they were saying, hey, you know, we have some concerns. You know, we, 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 you know, and they cited some of the things that he was doing. You know, the fact that he didn't seem to be able to distinguish, you know, truth from fiction and some of those other things. Uh, and then after he was actually in office, uh, two psychiatrists, uh, Lifton from Columbia and uh, Herman from uh, Harvard, you know, they went a little further and basically they did specify, you know, the, the fact that his being involved with nuclear decisions, you know, was something that they didn't think was did, good, did, that they thought was dangerous. Do you the think country. they represented, uh, sorry, the unspoken majority? Well, I, I, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but I mean, the numbers were astounding. Uh, people uh, took a petition. Uh, the uh, guy uh, formed a movement called the Duty to Warn Movement. And uh, at last count, there were at least 68,000 mainly psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health pr practitioners. There were some other people who signed also um, saying that they thought uh, they had a duty to warn that this man was uh, unfit and dangerous. Well, I, I just saw in the papers recently, it's a General Hayden, and he's in charge of a strategic command for nuclear weaponry. And he was saying, basically, if he was told to do a preemptive strike and he thought it was illegal, he would refuse to do such. That's a, that's a very <laughs> powerful statement from a military person, because one of the things the Constitution is not ambiguous about is the president's role as the commander in chief of the uh, armed forces. So uh, that shows you just how seriously uh, people are taking this thing. Yeah, I think they're serious because the president could, could order a strike, and he obviously needs to have a few other people to carry it out. But when Trump said recently about um, two things, one, he said, uh, what's the point of having all these nuclear weapons if you can't use them? <laughs> then the second thing he says, oh, if we use nuclear weapons, uh, the East would be over there. It means the casualties would be over there. And it's been already estimated maybe 100,000 would die in a conventional war in the Korean Peninsula, and certainly millions with nuclear weapons. But when he said the casualties are over there, what is that saying about American soldiers who are stationed in Korea and Japan? Well, uh, are, are they expendable? I guess they would be what he calls collateral damage. But you know, uh, even the statement itself, it shows you he's a us them type of guy. He is a white nationalist. You know, what I mean, just plain and simple, he is a white nationalist with white nationalist roots, and he thinks you you know that kind of uh, a binary way of looking at the world. He thinks of it that way. So uh, I mean, show, you, you you see that he has no uh, sort of ethics around the issue of conservation. You know, polluting the water. You know, just, just a simple thing like coal going into the water. So I don't think he understands that the same wind that blows in Korea blows here in the United States. The same water that flows in the ocean in Korea flows over here. So if you nuke people, that radioactivity goes all around the world. And then the other thing is, is that he has that sense of superiority that um, white nationalists have. They don't ever think of somebody else being able to strike back at them. And it's a little strange because, from my estimation, Korea beat them in the first war they had. Yeah, it was the so-called police action. It's still a truce. I, if you if you're six foot six and three hundred pounds, and you fight a guy that's five foot two, and one hundred and ten pounds, and uh, a half hour later you all are still fighting, that little guy just beat you behind. 
because you were supposed to wipe him out just like that. So the United States, they didn't get any territory, they didn't, uh, they didn't get any apologies, they didn't get anything. So they really lost. A, sta a, a draw between a 250-pound guy and a 100-pound guy is a defeat for the 250-pound guy. And uh, so they lost to Korea before, and they lost to a nation smaller than that in Vietnam. You know, um, so you would think, but, but, but in Trump's case, it's understandable because he's shown on many occasions he has no, no knowledge of history, no understanding of history. He thinks, you know, Frederick Douglass is still alive, you know. Uh, some, 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 some people came to him about something. They said something about Fred, Frederick Douglass, and he was saying, to tell Fred hello for me or he's something like that. He's doing a great job. <laughs> Fred's doing a great job. Yeah. And continue yeah, yeah, to, yeah, be, yeah, to yeah. be in the news. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, what about Trump's supporters? Because we know there's an erosion among independents, and, but he's still highly uh, acceptable to his base. Uh, what does that say about the base? Are they, these people just totally ignorant about history, or are they just so, so interested in maintaining what, what power they have through Trump? That's a great question, Dr. Surreal. You know, I mean, there have been studies that already showed that, uh, you know, the average high school graduate, they don't know which came first, the Civil War or the Revolutionary War. You know, I mean, the state of uh, education in America is really, uh, uh, has really deteriorated. And uh, there are many nations who have better educational systems than the uh, United States. And uh, the general uh, lack of knowledge of history and the lack of knowledge even of their own constitution. Well, I saw in the paper just a couple of days ago that uh, one out of three Americans can name one form of government, the executive, the legislative, or the judicial. Can't and, name one, one of the branches of government? No, can't name mm -hmm. any. And, and these are the people who are electing Well, you saw people. a presidential candidate that couldn't name uh, the, 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 the members of the cabinet, the divisions of the cabinet that he, you know, he was going to be in charge of. Yeah. So uh, it, it, you, I think that the question is so good because more than Trump, you know, you don't have to worry about Trump. You have to worry about, well, what are the conditions and the circumstances of the electorate uh, that could allow a person like this to get into office? So based on your professional experience, expertise, uh, how do you think Trump would react if he was impeached psychologically? This is a, this is a critical question. I mean, I don't think, see, if, if Obama was to lose, would have lost, say, uh, the mandate of the public, you know, if he, that he respected the American form of government, and, this, and he, you know, he kind of seemed to see it as something sacred, I think he would have stepped down just with the impeachment. The impeachment is to be accused, all right? So he would have stepped down just from, but this guy, he gives every sign that he would fight like a junkyard dog, uh, no matter how many people were against him. I think if Ivanka were charged with something, or if uh, his uh, wife or his son or his son-in-law, any of them. Uh, I don't, you know, I think Obama would have been, it, it, you know, with, with similar uh, proximity of relatives, he would have been uh, reluctant to use the uh, power to pardon because he wouldn't want to call, and if he were charged, he wouldn't want to try to use the power of pardon because it would be, it would be, that would cause a constitutional crisis. I mean, no one has ever done that. No president has ever used the power of pardon for himself. He asked that question, can I pardon myself? I mean, I, I, that's what he's, he's always concerned with power. Can I do it? Do I have the power to do it? And if he has the power to do it, he would do it. He has no problem with, uh, uh, disrupting the whole government. He has no power, I mean, he has no problem with uh, challenging every tradition. He, those aren't his traditions. He's, 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 a, uh, he's a white nationalist. Well, let's, uh, like, let's speculate a little bit. As commander in chief, if he was told, Mr. President, like Nixon was told, Mr. President, uh, uh, you're going to be impeached, which means the House is against you, and the Senate is going to investigate you, and you're going to lose. So Nixon resigned. Do you think Trump in his delusional state will say, I'm commander in chief, the military is going to protect me? <laughs> I think that, that one of the problems that people make, I think, is assuming that because he seems off base, that he has no ability to strategize, and no ability to uh, do clever things. Okay? And if you look, I guess there are two points of view. Some people think that 
the permanent government has put generals all around him. But he could be thinking long range of that if he gets any rebellion from the military, he's going to replace those people. As commander in chief, he, can, he, could, he, could just, he could remove that person for saying that right now. The person you cited as being, you know, under the Constitution, he could remove that person right now. And your problem would be when you have uh, a bunch of military people that he has appointed or that are loyal to him, then now you have the problem of that, you know, paper. You have your rights are on pa are paper rights. The military's rights aren't paper. The military has bullets, you know, uh, uh, bombs, trump paper every time. And you can see that any place around. You've, you've seen, see, coups happen all the time, and they're military in nature, those coups, for the most part, the ones that are successful. And it doesn't matter what your constitution says. You know, you have a, a bunch of soldiers with guns that say we're in charge now, then he'll be in charge. Now, Trump has this, how do you explain it? He has this, um, I'll use the word crazy, this crazy fascination by seeking and needing praise and people to express admiration and love for him. What, what does that say to you as a psychiatrist? Well, he has a lot of things. He also has a sense of entitlement, a lot of grandiosity. You just described narcissistic people. He's narcissistic, you know, uh, I think, I don't think there'd be anybody that would uh, challenge that. I'm not so interested in the specific diagnosis. You know, some people say, well, he has a narcissistic personality disorder. Other people m want to make him psychotic. Uh, I don't think he's really out of touch with reality in the sense of that he thinks there's somebody talking to him or anything like that. I think that uh, he, he is a narcissistic person and that he has been trained to use power for personal advantage. And I think uh, he has the personality to try to use per power for personality and, the power, and to use it exploitatively uh, when he can get away with it. If, if you were going to have him as a patient, how, how would you treat him? Is there anybody watching or any cameras? <laughs> I mean, like, trying, I mean, like you, let's say you're trying to help him and you have to ask questions and probe and so forth into the psyche. S sometimes you have to hurt people to help them, you know. No, I'm kidding around. I mean, uh, the problem is, is that some people are troubled. Troubled people seek help. People that are troubling and, don't, and aren't troubled, they don't, they don't seek help. You know, uh, the guy that takes every object on the table and lines them all up perfectly into little square, you know, he doesn't seek help because he, that, that makes him feel better to do that. Now, it's when the people around him say, John, stop lining up all the furniture, stop, you know, lining up the breakfast food and that sort of thing, that, that causes him stress. So Trump has so much money, he's a, trouble, he's a, tru he's a troubling person. He's not troubled. He's a troubling person. His exploitation troubles other people. You know, his grandiosity, his lying troubles other people. It doesn't trouble him because he has enough money to buy his way out of most situations. This is before he came into office. Uh, now he has the power of the presidency behind him. He, he, he's not the per type of person to seek help. He would have to be troubled to seek help. So that, that's, my, that's my point of view on that. Uh, and, yeah. and the time that we have remaining, uh, does Trump behavior remind you of anybody else, in, say, in a political sense? Well, his, his, his behavior reminds me of almost any dictator uh, who hasn't yet seized every instrument of state power. From the standpoint of his relationship with black people, I mean, I can't separate him from the 18 presidents that kept us uh, locked up wherever they kept us locked up as slaves. You know, 18 presidents, I mean, what's crazier than that? Right? And still, what's, be, what's, still, and still being honored today with statues yeah, and monuments. What's, what's crazier than, you know, saying all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and then, uh, you know, sneaking around with a 14-year-old girl taking her to Paris uh, that you own. I mean, th that's, that's pretty crazy. So, you know, we could use that word on Donald Trump, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that there have been a lot of crazy presidents. Well, I'd call him crazy. What would be the psychological term for his behavior? Well, as I said before, some people would call it narcissistic. Some people point out the sociopathic aspects of it. And then there are some people who feel that it has gone so far, they believe that he does, he's not really cognizant of the fact that he's lying, and they call him psychotic. 
So there have been a lot of names that have been thrown around for him. I mean, certainly the kind of temper tantrums that he throws sometimes, uh, that, can be, uh, that can be included under narcissism. But uh, he's a bit histrionic, too. He likes, I mean, this is the first president that you've ever had that's been on, like, the cover of Playboy, right? Uh, this is the first president that ever appeared in softcore porn. You know, uh, he's, a, he's a bit of a ham, you know? So there are a lot of words that could be thrown around about him. But I think, you know, the key pieces that are important for us is that he is exploitative, that he is uh, uh, hierarchical, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a, a white nationalist, and we are on the bottom of his hierarchy. Well, explain, explain to our audience what do you mean by white nationalist? Well, I mean, what I mean by a white nationalist is a person who operates uh, with the idea that white people are superior, that white people deserve more, and that the interests of white people have to be preserved over all other things, over any other principle. You know, not morality, not legality, not anything. Nothing else uh, trumps that. You know, so that a white nationalist, uh, he could have a religion that says, uh, thou shalt not kill. But if you try to escape from his slave ship, he's going to kill you, right? Because you know, you're a capital, you represent money for him. He's got, he's, you know, so that's what I mean by a white nationalist. I mean, a white nationalist is a person who feels that they have the burden to subjugate everyone else in the interests of their group. He uses the word America, okay? But you have to understand, he doesn't include us in his America. You know, we're not included in his America. So, uh, that's what I mean by a white nationalist. I hope that it, you know, explains. Yeah, it's, uh, because you know, terms come out sometimes without uh, definitions. And well, I mean, like for instance, organizations of white nationalists include things like the American Nazi Party, the KKK, that sort of thing. And so we know that he has strong white nationalist roots. His father was in the KKK. He says no, but all the evidence says well, yes. We know based on the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, does the check of hate groups. And we know they have increased tremendously once Obama became president. And they increased more <laughs> since Trump has become president because they feel safe. They feel that they have a friend in the White House. They know they have a friend in the White House. You know, when he was asked about uh, how did he feel about the support of the American Nazi Party and the Ku Klux Klan, he kind of said, well, I'm not really familiar with them. But it's, it's strange because his daddy was arrested in 1927 at a Klan rally. His daddy, one of the newspapers said, was wearing full Klan regalia. His uh, daddy and him uh, discriminated against black people in their housing, and actually the government sued them, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, the, 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 you know, the government charged them with that. And he, in turn, countersued uh, the government. So he, he, knows what, what, he knows what the Klan is, because his daddy was a Klan's member. And then the other thing is that him and his father lied about their Germanic roots for decades. Even in his book, The Art of the Deal, they claimed they were from Sweden. Now, why do you think they did that? They changed the spelling of the name, too. They did that because they knew of the enmity with Ger you know, against Germany and the Nazis. And so, so he knew enough about Nazis to hide his identity, and he knew enough about uh, the Klan to deny his father was in it. So it's, uh, you know, he's being uh, 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 totally false when he says that uh, he doesn't know anything about them. I mean, they know, they, they, they love him and he loves them. That's why he was making excuses for them after uh, Charlottesville. Yeah, he said there are good people on both sides. <laughs> Uh, well, you, had, you had written about uh, Trump and Amsterdam News. Are there any forthcoming uh, essays on the same subject? Absolutely. Um, the, those essays, I, I was paralleling what I did with uh, Rudolf Giuliani. I wrote a book called The Unauthorized Psychoanalysis of Rudolf Giuliani. The first seven chapters I published uh, in the uh, Amsterdam News back uh, some years ago. Now, this one is called uh, These Chapters that I published in the uh, Amsterdam News. They, they, they came under the uh, title of uh, The Unauthorized Psychoanalysis of Donald Trump. Seven of them were published in the Amsterdam. Excuse me, an eighth one was published in the uh, Black Star News. And a ninth article that didn't have that same title uh, was uh, called Duty to Warn. That was published uh, on the front page of the Amsterdam News. Will this be available in a pamphlet or a book form for it'll sale? Be, it'll be available in a, uh, a paperback form uh, by Kwanzaa. So how pe 
how can the interested people get copies? Oh, thank you. Okay, well, uh, you can um, you can contact CMOTAP. Uh, uh, you can look online for CMOTAP, and there'll be other ways if yeah, you just look out, online. Spell out the letters. Uh, C E M O T A P, uh, and that stands for the Committee to Eliminate Media Offensive to African People. And uh, CMOTAP Publications published the first one, and we'll publish this one also. And you also meet fairly regularly in Queenstown. Absolutely. Every, at, at, fourth, at uh, or location. every fourth Saturday, we meet at 13505 Rockaway Boulevard. Thank you, Dr. Sorrell. 13505 Rockaway Boulevard, South Ozone Park, Queens, 11420. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. McIntosh, for very enlightened uh, observation of number 45, because as you and many others have a hard to kind of hard to say president in front of Trump's name, but unfortunately, that's what the American public thought they wanted. So it's very good talking with you, and uh, certainly we'll do it again in the future. Thanks so much, Dr. So thank you. Okay. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast, and we continue to encourage you to tune in, to write, and to tell a friend. And please visit our website at www.ccptv.org. But until next time, Louise Dente saying... Thank you.